So Andrew is the uh, Distinguished uh, Professor of Computer Science at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. He is also the Director for the Information Extraction and Synthesis Lab and the Center for uh, Data Science. And I was able to say that without the, uh, with the slide, so that's good. I think, uh, you know, Andrew, we're especially excited. He's, he's uh, you know, 250 publication, over 50,000 citations, all in, uh, you know, AI, core AI, machine learning, uh, natural language processing, uh, you know, reinforcement learning. And so his, his areas in terms of being able to uh, learn representations, uh, to, to create learned representations uh, from data and structured knowledge uh, to support uh, higher levels of reasoning is, is truly at the, uh, the forefront of AI research. So with that, please, please welcome Andrew. Let's see, my screen didn't flash yet. Thank you, Lisa. I really enjoyed Rob's talk so much. And I actually hope that I have some research that may help him more in the future. Um, so I want to thank IBM for the invitation and for their support while I'm here. I also want to thank um, uh, sorry, the Center for Data Science, uh, on which I direct, uh, which is not only enabling us to increase dramatically say, by 14 tenure track positions, the number of machine learning faculty we're hiring, but also enabled a lot of this research because we used a large grant to gather um, a large computational cluster that has over 800 GPUs in it, which uh, has just dramatically uh, changed the way that we do research. Um, I think it might be, I was talking with Joshua maybe a while ago, saying it might be the largest academic GPU installation uh, anywhere in North America. Okay, um, and then for the industry folks in the audience, I wanna make sure that you know about, um, in about a month, uh, a data science specific career fair that we'll be having, um, at which a lot of our industrial partners um, have found a lot of good matches. This is, it's mostly graduate students and they present posters as well. Okay, but we're here to talk about knowledge representation and reasoning, um, uh, which is one of the core aspects of artificial intelligence, and in particular, it's, uh, it's uh, application to science. And we really could use a lot of help because the progress of science is accelerating rapidly, and this means that the volume of publications is increasing as well. There was a survey recently of scientists, 85% of whom said, I'm not able to keep up with all the research in my field, and I think the other 15% are lying. And they need not just a search engine to help them find things. They're in the midst of designing experiments, deciding what uh, um, directions to take in science next. They really need navigational tools that will help them reason about science um, uh, in order to uh, um, help them accelerate their scientific progress. And there are many companies which in their youth started uh, by focusing on keyword search, which now that we're spending more time in front of smaller screens are also thinking about dialogue systems, question answering, knowledge bases, a more structured view of the world in order to provide more succinct answers to questions, to provide ways to browse amongst entities through various types of relations. Types of relations here are shown um, uh, in, in the bold text uh, um, uh, here. So these are types of relations. The catalog of the different types in this knowledge base uh, was designed by humans to say, well, what are the kind of different semantics of relation types that we want to create? And they thought very hard about it. They created a large list. But in a sense, it's not really large enough. Because just as in web search, the great diversity of things that people ask about, the majority of that mass is in the long tail of, uh, um, of, of what people are asking about, and the, the, broad, the broad diversity. So for example, if you want to know, well, who did Jeff Bezos criticize, the Google Knowledge Graph or uh, Freebase or many others can't tell you because they didn't create this relation um, in their knowledge base. So what we're really interested in is a knowledge base with an open schema, sort of like keyword search where you can ask about absolutely anything, but at the same time that has a structure um, of entities and relations and one that will support reasoning. And that's really what this talk is going to be about. So we're going to talk about going from text to knowledge bases to reasoning, and especially doing this in the context of science. And this is um, an area which I've had interest for quite some time, about a decade before Google Scholar existed. Some colleagues and I at Carnegie Mellon built a system that had many of the similar features. You can tell how old this is by looking at the header in the, in the web browser there. When I arrived at UMass, we built a more modern system that knew not just about people and papers, but institutions, conferences, journals, grants, advisors, uh, and the rest. And really now we're working on um, multiple thrusts, one of which is to build a knowledge base of all scientists in the world and their expertise and their career path history uh, um, by gathering information from many places. 
as well as to build a knowledge base of scientific entities and relations, things like materials, equipment, organisms, processes, tasks, methods, many of the things that we heard about uh, from Rob. And so we would like to do this for the obvious reasons. Um, just as a brief aside, I'm also very interested in revolutionizing scientific peer review. I think the time, it's high time that this happened. The way that scientific workflows for review happen right now are designed in the times when that we were printing research on paper and sending it through the post, and we have much better methods of doing this now. We've built a system um, called openreview.net that was actually, um, uh, that just served the deadline for the iClear conference uh, um, uh, just last week, um, accepted about 1,000 and a half papers in just a few hours. Um, it's being used by about 20 different venues now. We're in discussions with ICML, CPPR, and others. And if afterwards you want to talk about that, I would love to tell you more about that. Um, all right, but what I mostly want to talk about here is building a knowledge base of scientific entities. So um, I had been working with uh, a Canadian startup company that shared many of the same goals that was acquired by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. This is not Facebook, but the philanthropic arm uh, of where um, Zuckerberg has pledged to give away the vast majority of his wealth. Uh, um, um, and they have an extremely large knowledge base um, uh, uh, based on uh, of scientific entities. If we just take one column here, so like. Um, uh, you know, 26 million papers, over 400,000 drugs, 36,000 journals, um, many of these connected in the web, and we've been working together um, uh, um, to both enlarge that knowledge base and to do reasoning about it with techniques that I'll describe in a minute. We've also been collaborating with uh, uh, folks here right, right here at MIT in material science um, to gather hundreds of thousands of research papers uh, um, from material science, automatically finding the section where they describe the recipe and it really does look like a recipe for cooking up a brand new batch of, say, car battery materials of the future, um, extracting that recipe as a structured graph, um, and then doing analysis on a large collection of recipes to understand the relationships between the recipes and the properties of the materials that result to suggest brand new recipes that have never been tried before that might um, help us address global warming issues a little bit quicker. Um, we also have been working with the US Patent Office to design um, uh, new, more accurate methods of resolving authors of both patents and research papers. And um, uh, this is work by Nick Monaf, who's here with us today and has a poster here today. And um, um, his work is now being deployed as part of the US Patent Office uh, uh, workflow. Okay, but <clears throat> those are just a few examples. Mostly I want to talk about the technology for how this happens. And in a traditional knowledge base, <coughs> The knowledge base consists of entities and relations, and as I was describing before, some hand-designed schema for entity types and relation types. And this is what's exactly what's in Freebase and various other traditional knowledge bases, as well as in medical knowledge bases uh, like SNOMED and many others. We're going to be talking instead about uh, replacing the hand design schema with something we call universal schema, which I'll describe in a moment, which is based on vector embeddings and deep learning in order to gain some generalization capabilities, and also using textual content and looking quite a bit at the degree to which that raw text itself can serve as a knowledge base, but we also want to build a graph at the same time in order to be able to navigate through them and this landscape of, um, sort of smooth landscape of working with raw text versus a very structured content. Um, but today, the two technical things I want to focus on most are some work on chains of reasoning with recurrent neural networks in a way that really bridges symbolic AI and, uh, um, and, um, uh, um, and vector-based or neural network AI. And we're going to talk about using reinforcement learning to search for proofs in this space. And I also want to talk about efficient methods of representing taxonomies and common sense uh, um, using a new technology we've been working on recently that we call box embeddings. Okay, but let's first start with an introduction. So to build a knowledge base, we usually right, start with a raw set of text. We need, from there, we need to find some entities. We need to resolve multiple occurrences of those in both unstructured and structured sources, do relation extraction on top of those, put those into a knowledge base, um, which then, given a query, can hopefully answer some questions. And what I want to focus on most here are these, these types of data, the different types of entities, the different types of relations, and where they come from. So let's, um, let's first step back a little bit. We've given some raw text. And with apologies, this text does not actually have to do with science, because maybe many of us aren't bench scientists, and I want to work with data and make a presentation that we can all understand intuitively. But I'm going to rely on your imagination to understand how this would apply to science. So we're given some raw text. We, from that, we extract some uh, um, uh, the names of some entities, and we resolve them, knowing when Bill Gates uh, um, and Gates are referring to the same person. 
Um, from that, we can build a, a graph of these entities and the sentences in which they co-occur. But to really understand what's going on here, we, we'd like to know, well, what are the types of the entities appearing in the nodes of these graphs? And what are the types of the relations appearing on the edges between them? So let's focus on the entity type for a moment here. So here are some types that we may have had in our head that we thought would be important for our application. Um, and but, and we'd also, we're going to end up importing data from multiple sources uh, to help augment our graph. But that data will come from some other source and some other person to design some other schema that's almost surely not going to match our schema of different entity types. They'll just be, they'll be different. And unfortunately, it's, it's usually not so easy just to map them deterministically one on top of the other. Rather than overlapping by containment or by exact Im implicature, so often these concepts overlap you know, sort of parsely like this. So like a film subject, which is one of the columns here, is often a person, but, but sometimes it's a dog or, 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 or some other creature. And so they, they overlap parsely. Um, so rather than trying to map all of our semantics onto a single schema to rule them all. In universal schema, we're going to keep, about, keep, keep around all of our input schema, not try to cram all of our semantics into one, uh, you know, into, into one box, keep, embrace the full diversity of it all, and, under, and then learn something about how these um, different schemas have some mutual implicature um, among them. And furthermore, so, so actually, I'm only going to show a few examples here, but you can imagine next that we might be working with 20 or 100 different databases, all with their own different schema. And each one, they have thousands of different uh, schema items in them. And in addition to that, we're going to take a lot of our schema from the raw text itself. Grammatical compositions like a positives and others express entity types. And, um, and we'll let the raw text, which is conveying meaning, serve as its own schema as well. So an additional tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of schema items might come from here as well. So we're going to keep these all around. And this is what I mean by universal schema. So it's our job to take some input context and to classify the appearance of this entity as to which, uh, which entity type it is. And rather than having a set of parameters shown as a purple vector here in the original you know, raw feature space, we're going to learn them in some compacted latent space. I think about it's like a word embedding in, say, 100-dimensional, 200-dimensional space where the individual dimensions don't really have any meaning here. But we're going to learn these vector embeddings so that types that have similar meaning appear near each other in this vector space. And the entities we want to classify will get embedded in the same space. And I can make a prediction about whether some entity you know, is an instance of some type by doing a dot product between these entities. So at training time, I'll observe from, I'll observe from my raw data some of these entities and uh, um, which, um, which types they belong to. And it's um, my job for the sake of full completion to do matrix completion. Uh, um, to fill in some of those missing ones so that even though I didn't observe originally that Bill was an executive, I can predict nonetheless he is an executive from the co-occurrence of other types that I did observe him for. And this kind of matrix completion is exactly what Netflix uses to recommend movies to you, given the partially completed matrix of what you and others have told it about what movies you'd like. Um, the same thing can be done for relation types, in which we have different types of relations in the columns from both multiple structured sources and from text, and then entity pairs in the rows. And again, we can do matrix completion to predict new relation types. Um, and just to give you some visceral sense of how this works, for example, this comes from some real data that we ran on. The system observed that Kevin Boyle was a historian at Ohio State, and from that we predicted that he's a professor at Ohio State. And, uh, and yet, in a demonstration of the model's ability to represent asymmetries, when we observed that Freeman as a professor at Harvard, we didn't necessarily infer that he's a historian. Um, all right, so here we end up with the knowledge base that's a graph of entities and relations in which rather than having symbols sitting on the nodes and edges of the graph to communicate the semantics of what we really mean here, we have these vectors instead. Vectors representing a broad diversity of different kinds of semantics. And I find this really interesting. Uh, um, think about mixing vector representations and, and, and graph representations. And furthermore, thinking about how you know, philosophy and computer science and mathematics have spent decades studying what it means to do logical reasoning on symbols. Um, and here we're about to ask ourselves, well, what does it mean to do logical reasoning on vectors instead of symbols? Because reasoning is exactly what we'd like to do in this kind of knowledge graph. So here's, here's what I mean by this. Let's say that someone asks about the nature of the relationship between Melinda and Seattle. Uh, 
Well, we didn't observe any raw evidence of what that relationship is, um, but there is some other evidence in the graph that we can form through some chains of reasoning, right? That literally consists of a chain through the graph, or some path through the graph, right? Melinda is married to Bill, who's chairman of Microsoft, headquartered in Seattle, and perhaps we can use that as evidence with some probability that perhaps Melinda lives in Seattle. And then traditionally, I would write this down as, as a symbolic rule, right? If A is the spouse of B, and B is the chairman of C, and so on, then A lives in D. But what if in the data that we're asking about, instead of chairman, it was CEO? OK, well, we need another rule for that. Or what if it was COO instead? OK, well, we need another rule for that. Or what if it's child of instead of spouse of? Well, now we need a combinatorial combination of a number of different rules to cover all these cases, and, and hence the difficulty of symbolic AI. But here we have vectors on these, uh, um, in this graph instead, which are exactly designed to help us, help us generalize. And so we've been working with methods that consume arbitrary length chains through a graph like this um, at each stage, pumping that vector into a recurrent neural network um, that consumes the new piece of context in the chain and at each stage outputs a new vector that's, that represents the nature of the semantics of, but between the two, uh, um, uh, the two nodes that are the endpoints so far. And when I add another link, then uh, I now you know, compose my semantics further to represent the nature of the relationship between them. And indeed, when we train on data and pass a path like this into our network, it does predict um, uh, or the vector it produces is very close to the vector for the symbol it lives in. So the neural network has learned how to do logical reasoning uh, in, in this method that goes beyond symbols that learns to generalize. So um, we've run this on a moderate amount of data from Freebase and from text. Uh, and to give you a sense of the kind of paths that it can learn. So here we're predicting the relation a book and the original language in which the book was written. And, um, and here's the path that the method discovers. It goes from a book to some other book that's previous in a series of books, think like Harry Potter, um, to the author of that book, to the nationality of that author, to somebody else who shares the same nationality, to what language do they speak. And that seems like a reasonable chain to have some level of inference about what, what language we think the book was originally written in. And there are many other examples I'm not going to take the time to show you. All right, so for some of you in the audience, you've seen some of this context before. Um, sorry, sorry, let me say first that, uh, you know, as is typical in research, uh, um, in comparison with an older symbolic method that came out of Carnegie Mellon in 2012, over time we are you know, gradually making accuracy improvements, and I think we're on our way towards a system that would be usable for deployment. Um, but uh, the, some newer work that I want to describe uh, uh, today are, are um, addressing the situation that occurs in really large graphs in which it takes some careful effort in order to find the, um, to find the chain that gives you a proof for the answer that we, uh, um, uh, um, uh, for the answer to our question, um, right? So there's some paths um, that might be relevant to the question that we have, but there are many other paths that are that kind of just don't really carry any meaning at all or just not relevant to the question that we're trying to ask. Um, and in our original work, we were just searching through the graph by doing random, uh, really random walks, but that's really not sufficient for really large scientific graphs. So we've been doing work on using reinforcement learning to guide the search for paths that prove the answer to the question that's being asked. Um, so what does this look like? We uh, start at some entity. At each entity, there's a large choice of different outgoing edges that we could follow in the graph. We, uh, um, we, we make some choice. We continue to follow the graph until we, the model thinks that it's arrived at an answer. If the answer is correct, then we give the reasoning agent a reward. If it's an incorrect answer, we give it no reward. We give it multiple chances to explore. Uh, um, credit for right and wrong answers back, uh, you know, uh, flows backwards through the graph. Um, and we can do some learning. So this is a case of, you know, we want to learn this end to end by gradient descent. Uh, we are, you know, the training objective is to maximize expected reward. The choices to be made are discrete, and so we, use the, we need to use the reinforced trick in order to get a smooth gradient out of a set of discrete choices. But this, together with some, uh, um, you know, some various methods like multiple rollouts per question, allows the system to converge and to reach, um, to reach very nice answers. Some other work that I'm not describing on a slide here, but I think for which there's a poster today, um, is using methods that are quite similar to this, uh, even in a very large corpus, deciding even which paragraphs to read next in order to, just, uh, to look for the answer to some question in some open-ended QA system. Um, 
So to give you a sense of the kind of path that this reinforcement learning agent is able to find, what it thinks of as most efficient, when asked, say, what's the, the country of origin for the film Step Up Revolution, it, it had no immediate evidence for what that was, but it jumps from the film to its production company to where the production company was located, um, et cetera. All right, so this is one, so here are some examples in general knowledge. We're now actually you know, very interested in making work on, in, in biomedicine. We've been collaborating with Andrew Sue at the Scripps Institute on um, applying this to, to biomedical data and we're looking at much more complicated paths of, uh, of longer length. And uh, yeah, we're excited about this work and would be very happy to find other collaborative, uh, collaborators. Um, all right, so I also find it interesting, let's see, how am I doing for time? Uh, that you know, these, when there are many, many types, it's often the case, oh, sorry, let me say something else first. So we, um, what we talked about so far fits into a worldview that I think somewhat like this. At the bottom in orange, I'm trying to show some raw text here with entities in these ovals and the crayon mark is like some textual evidence of a relationship between them. And we use those to, you know, after linking them to some entities to infer that, well, I think there's some relation between these entities and the knowledge base. And this, this pretty much describes what we've been talking about so far in terms of raw evidence and, the, and the, uh, the inferences we're making at the entity level. But I actually think that what we should be doing should look much more like this. And, and that is that sometimes it's not sufficient to reason about relations at the raw entity level, but sometimes the relations are only really true in particular contexts. Like this gene may upregulate this protein, um, but, uh, but, you know, but only this gene when it's expressed in liver tissue and not some other tissue of the body or under certain metabolic conditions. Um, and so we need to reason about what I think of as sub-entities um, or entities in a particular context, maybe somewhat um, intuitively analogous to there's Barack Obama the entity, but there's all, then there's Barack Obama as teenager in Hawaii and a senator from Illinois and as uh, um, you know, president and past president and, and different relations were true of Obama during these different stages. Um, of course, we can also make some inferences at the entity level, but then there are also relations that we can learn among types at even higher levels of abstraction. And I think about this as common sense uh, um, relations among types. And so we'd really like to be reasoning throughout this graph and to reason about um, hierarchies of concepts uh, um, that exist in some hypernym relation um, uh, um, uh, throughout. And so this has us thinking quite a bit about these types of entities and how it's often the case that they exist in hierarchies and how can we use these taxonomies um, to help improve inference. So we can work with various embedding methods that are, that are aware of these, uh, um, uh, of these taxonomies um, and use distance measures between vectors um, that, that can be asymmetric to represent the asymmetric is there relationship there. So things like bilinear um, mappings that go through, instead of just a simple dot product through some, uh, through some matrix in the middle, um, yield some asymmetry. Also, if we have complex vectors, then those also have some asymmetry. We can represent hierarchical relationships there as well. And then um, when we see some textual mention, we can train some model that will create a vector for some textual mention and, uh, and then ask, well, you know, does this vector have the is a relationship with founder uh, in order to answer questions um, about types, but furthermore also to leverage the hierarchy because we will also will have trained on pairs of entities, that, of pairs of types that fall into the hierarchy. And um, so we've been looking at various sources of data in which there are fine-grained types that exist in a, in a hierarchy. And probably the most widely used data set for fine-grained types has been the FIGER data set with 120 types. But we wanted something much more substantial to reason in a much more fine-grained fashion. So we created a new data set called TypeNet with almost 2,000 uh, uh, types in it. And what we find on this data set, um, which this gives you some intuition for its level of granularity um, and what its shape looks like, um, is that um, leveraging the hierarchy yields to more than 20% decrease in relative error, like here going from 68% um, up at the top to 78% uh, um, uh, percent by, by using the fact that we know about these things fall into a hierarchy. Um, all right. So lastly, we've been thinking further about other more rich ways to represent um, taxonomies, ontology, this kind of implicature, ones based not purely on vector points in space, but something that really, in a way, more inherently represents the breadth of a concept. And a few years ago, we did some work on using um, 
uh, what we call Gaussian embedding. So for each concept, rather than being a vector, there would be a Gaussian region in space that can have different variances. And we, after training on some raw Wikipedia text, we were able to learn that person is a broad concept with high variance, and that a musical composer is something much more specific that sits inside of it, and that famous is a broad concept. And we even just naturally learned that Johann Sebastian Bach sits exactly at this intersection, which was nice to see. Um, and so, yeah. An embedding method that is able to capture variance is, has some nice advantages. Um, but Gaussians in particular have some disadvantages. And one of them is that it's not closed under intersection. Right? The intersection of two Gaussians is not a Gaussian. And so recently, we, um, we've been looking at some other methods that, that do have this closed property. One of them is um, work by others on order embeddings that uh, defines each, um, has for you know, each concept of a, a vector that's constrained to be non-negative and says that that vector actually defines a region of space that spreads out away from the origin. And, um, and so the intersection between two concepts is exactly the point where the intersects here as well as the intersection that spreads away from the origin. And so um, this is closed on intersection, but the model mathematically is just not able to capture negative correlations. Um, and so, we, uh, just last year, uh, have an ACL paper on this thing we call box embeddings, in which for each concept, there is an n-dimensional box. Uh, um, and uh, the box is defined by a center and by its widths in each dimension. So it effectively just doubles the number of parameters, not that much. It's closed under intersection, because the intersection of two boxes is always another box. And it can represent negative correlations. So you can think about these a lot like Venn diagrams, right? And the, you know, the volume of the box will be proportional to its marginal probability. The volume of intersections uh, can be used to calculate conditional probabilities. And we can also condition on multiple other boxes, looking at the intersection of all of them, to answer really quite complicated questions about conditioned on this evidence, what do we believe about the probability that certain other things are true. In fact, we're even investigating these as a whole cloth alternative to graphical models. Um, I think there are some things that these definitely will do worse than graphical models, but some things that they will do better than graphical models in that they can efficiently do inference on, say, hundreds of thousands of variables and answer probabilistic questions about them in ways that don't rely on there being sparsity among the dependencies among them. Um, so on some toy data that we just created by hand for the sake of just understanding what was going on in the model, what we find is that um, in comparison with order embeddings, our model is able to you know, learn sensible boxes with sensible overlaps and to use the space well, and in fact, um, fit it much better. So here's the true conditional probability table that was part of our training data. Um, order embeddings was not able to match that very well at all, but our boxes were able to match it quite well. Um, and we can see that it's also able to represent negative, embedding, uh, uh, so negative correlations. So here we're asking, well, what's the probability of being a plant conditioned on nothing, just the prior is this, but conditioned on being green, your probability of being a plant goes up. What's the probability of being a plant given that you're a snake? Well, it's zero, that's a negative correlation, and that's what order embeddings would not have been able to represent at all. Um, and even with multiple queries, we can represent things uh, like this. So you know, what's your probability of being a deer, uh, given that you're not white, um, and so on. Um, all right, so, but what really matters and what's more interesting to me is something like this, in which we are um, operating on arbitrary pieces of text and doing what I really think of as a kind of common sense reasoning. So um, there's a Flickr data set of, um, in which we're, we're gonna not concern ourselves with the, with the images, but which just the textual captions that people put on these images. Um, and it's a large collection. And for each caption, we're going to use a parser to break it down into smaller pieces um, so that we can get uh, um, both sort of, sort of fine-grained pieces of text and coarse-grained pieces of text that describe the image. So, um, uh, and then we can calculate conditional probabilities, right, by, um, you know, what's the, what's the um, or, or, you know, first of all, it's the marginal probability of saying finding an image of a dog. Well, uh, you know, how many images were labeled with the dog somewhere, even if the original caption was something much, um, much larger? There's the, the smaller case here. We can also ask about joint probabilities. You know, what's the probability of seeing both dog and grass together? Well, here's one, and we can do that by counting the number of images which dog appeared at all or which grass appeared at all. Um, and what we're going to do on our model is take an LSTM that's going to run over arbitrary length sequences of text, and the LSTM is going to output a box. Um, and, this, and then we can look at overlaps between these boxes to ask conditional probability, what I think of as sort of common sense type questions. So here are some simple examples. If you observe the, a caption like a person drags a suitcase, what's the probability that you would say that that implies that luggage is being dragged? Well, that's, uh, um, that's probability one. Um, 
If you're, if you're told, well, there's someone holding an instrument, what's the probability that you're in the basement? Well, that's low. It's, uh, it's not zero, but, uh, um, but it's low. And I would say that that represents a kind of common sense. And we're now applying this to, um, um, to scientific text. Our, one of our goals is to capture scientific common sense. Um, and this yielded a new state of the art on Flickr. And there's some new results about this, which you can um, also see in the poster by Lorraine Lee, one of my students who's here today. Um, all right. So what we, what we really want to be doing in the future is to be reasoning about large graphs like this with, with many entities at the sub-entity level and at the type level as well, represent their, their mutual implicature with boxes, and reason through chains in this graph uh, at various levels of abstraction um, uh, throughout. And this is the research path that we're on. Um, we've talked about representation and reasoning um, in text data, um, using instead of symbols, universal schema vector embeddings, and representing um, taxonomies by using box volumes. Um, we talked about chains of reasoning. And um, with that, I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Let's see, so how does this work? Oh, they're there. Sorry, thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, with scientific papers, what happens when there are contradictory relations that are extracted and added to the graph? OK, yeah, wonderful. Um, so in the original work, we uh, you know, take all the text as training data, and as so often happens in machine learning, you know, we both, in a way, assume that the training data is true, but the, but the training is robust to noise in that data. Um, when asked questions about what might be true, you know, uh, again, as is often the case in machine learning, we'll rely on most statements in the training data having been true, and we'll, sort of, we'll, we'll answer um, um, you know, sort of what the majority opinion was in the original um, raw training data. Um, I, in the, the chains of reasoning work so far, what we do is we look for many possible paths that could um, provide you know, evidence of a positive answer to something and, um, and you know, zero in or pay attention to that one path and then ask, is the, is the strength of that evidence above threshold for us to say yes? And I think this was a reasonable way to start, but, um, but what we're considering doing next uh, um, which I think is necessary, is also to look for negative evidence. Like, look for the path that would make us most strongly say no, and then to compare the positive and negative ev uh, evidence. Like, someone might ask, well, you know, um, do Bill and Melinda hate each other? Well, I don't know. Somewhere they might find some text that talked about some disagreement that they had, and, and if we zero in on that one piece of text, the, the system might say, well, they, they know that they hate each other. You know, but that then, you know, we should also have looked for, um, you know, evidence to the contrary and, and seen all this evidence that, well, they, you know, they run a nonprofit together and they're married and they have children in order to be able to say, well, no, of course they don't hate each other. Um, all right. Is the probability of plant given carrier actually zero? <laughs> well, I think the biologist can answer that better. I guess there are Venus flytraps, et cetera. Um, but I'm, if you, if you really mean to be asking me something else, feel free to pipe up again. So how do you deal with sparsity of the label data? Um, let's see here. I mean, you know, in matrix completion for Netflix, an incredibly sparse amount of the matrix is actually filled in, but when training happens. And, um, and you know, one of, you know, one of the powerful aspects of these uh, matrix completion methods based on vectors is that, that they tend to work quite well, even when the data is sparse. And this is also uh, um, uh, what we're finding here. Um, it, you know, of course, having more labeled data helps. And we do have a thread of research right now that's working on active learning in the universal schema context. If we did want to go ask, for, ask humans for, um, uh, for some additional labels, what should we ask them in order to get the best benefit? Um, but I would say that so far our evidence is that uh, is that it works well with sparsity. All right, thank you very much. Yeah.